Welcome to the 10x Strategies video. In this presentation, we cover the five strategies that make 10x work the way that it does. Now, for those who don't know, the central claim of 10x is that we can produce the same results compared to other traditional resistance exercise programs, but in 10% of the time. So for example, if the traditional resistance exercise program requires you to spend 300 minutes per week to get a certain result, let's say strength or muscle mass gain, fat loss, endurance, stress tolerance, 10x can produce the same result and in some cases superior results but only 10% of the time, 30 minutes a week instead. Now for some of you that might, might sound a little bit crazy but once you understand these strategies you will see how we are able to produce the most potent and productive adaptive response in the shortest um, workout possible. So let's get started. So the first strategy is what we call targeted muscle fatigue or muscle failure. And this is perhaps the most important and distinguishing feature of the 10x system. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this strategy so we, so, um, we can also better appreciate the subsequent strategies. But in order to appreciate this strategy, besides what I've written down here, it's important to know that all exercise programs or workouts have what we call an exercise mode. Now, targeted muscle fatigue is the mode of 10x. Now, what is an exercise mode? A mode is essentially the overarching objective or intention behind the program or the actual workout. And you get several different kinds of modes. And a mode is essentially what you've associated to what will produce the outcome that you want. So one of the most popular modes is that of burning calories. If you're trying, if you're doing exercise to see how many calories you can burn, obviously you're not going to be focused on you know learning how to move well, or it's not about the quality of muscular contraction. Um, it's more about just moving in you know in a haphazard way, um, just trying to burn as many calories as you possibly can. But you can imagine if that's your focus. You're not going to really focus on um, the things that actually matter and do produce results. So if you do get results, it's a byproduct. It's a haphazard and you probably have no idea why you're getting results. Now, another mode would be that of doing work, right? So doing as much work as you possibly can. So the focus is not on burning calories. It's actually doing as much work as you possibly can. Reps and sets and exercise, uh, exercises. Um, and usually in the shortest period of time possible, like CrossFit. Now, this for me is a lot better than you know focusing on calories, doing as much work. Doing work is also uh, uh, is important. Um, again, all these modes have their place, but the again the the, the focus of uh, you know the work model is again it's mostly going to be on um, you know chasing points, numbers, and things like that as the, as your uh, measure of progress. Another mode could be, um, instead of conditioning, it could be practice. So let's say you want to learn how to do a handstand. And so you're not focused on burning calories. You're not focused on doing as much work as you can. You're learning a new movement. And so that should be done in a you know, separate mode, a separate state. Um, now, the reason, to, the reason you should understand modes is because you need to ask yourself, what mode am I in? What am I trying to accomplish with my exercise program? And if my mode is calories, Will just burn calories really produce the results I want? Will I get stronger? Will I get fitter? Will I get more flexible? Answer is probably no, right? Um, same in, for the same way. If I, if I just do as much work as I possibly can, will I get fitter? Yes, you will. But um, I won't really know what particular type of exercise and amount of work is actually associated with the type of result that I want. Now, coming to targeted muscle fatigue as the mode of 10x, because our goal is to stimulate muscle growth, hypertrophy, strength, endurance, and stress tolerance, we want to understand what the mechanisms, in order for us to really, um, because 10x is focused on doing you know, the minimum necessary to produce the results that we want, we want to understand what the mechanisms of muscular growth are in order for us to exploit that directly as our mode. Now, and it turns out that um, inducing a deep level of fatigue in the most efficient way possible um, is not only necessary but su also sufficient to produce a, an adaptive response in terms of our strength and, mu and muscular growth. And so that's why that is our um, mode. And specifically, what research has shown is that 
um, the level of fatigue, fatigue is another word of like the weakening, strategically weakening the muscle um, is associated with triggering all three of the muscular uh, growth mechanisms or let's say triggers um, that we can basically stimulate in a single workout. Now in order to do that, um, we need two preconditions. The first is stability and focus. Now as you can imagine, we're not trying to learn a new skill. We are not trying to do an arbitrary amount of work. We're not trying to burn calories, right? The reason uh, uh, our focus is, is on um, targeting a specific muscle or muscle group and uh, producing an adaptive response in the quickest uh, and the most safe way possible um, in that workout. In order for us to do that, we need to have stability and what we call focus. Why stability? Okay. Because we're not trying to learn things, we're not trying to uh, be distracted by trying to balance and coordinate our movement patterns, we're just trying to recruit as much as many muscle fibers as we possibly can and target muscle, fatigue them, um, and uh, you know, to a point, that the minimum, to, the, to, let's say, you want to fatigue them to a minimum threshold, which seems to be 30% uh, reduction in our starting level of strength in a single set, although we do do two sets. Um, and there's reasons why, as you'll see in a moment. The two conditions are you want to be in a stable position, um, not distracted. You want to uh, have maximum muscular effort in a stable position. We're not focused on developing skill or doing as much work as we possibly can. So this next image basically illustrates what I'm talking about. Okay, On the left-hand side, this is a woman who has a very clear intention of wanting to stimulate strength and muscular growth in her um, quadricep muscles, in her leg muscles. Now, in order to do that in the shortest period of time possible, now remember, our goal is to remember our goal is to produce the the greatest adaptive, stimulate the greatest adaptive response in the shortest period of time. Right now, um, can you get results with multiple sets and in doing it in different ways? Yes, you can, but um, again, that, that's very time consuming, and you won't know exactly which set, what type of which exercise is exactly associated with what you're doing. So we're trying to um, extricate all of these um, extraneous variables and confounding variables from our, from our training. And so this woman on the left here, what she's doing here is what we call stabilized maximum effort. She's in a machine that stabilizes her so she's not distracted, not focused on balancing, coordinating her muscles, and just uh, inducing what we call an inroad or weakening of the muscle um, to a specific threshold at least 25 to 30 percent reduction in a starting level of strength in the shortest period of time which usually is about um, 8 to 12 reps five seconds per repetition to be able to do that contrast that for example with the guy on the right what I don't like uh, with the, uh, what, what I don't like about the guy on the right um, is that this guy is neither really working on a skill, he's not really learning how to do, let's say, a Cossack squat or side to side squat with great flexibility and, uh, and good form. He's also not really developing maximum strength. So what's he doing? Well, he's just really doing side to side squats with a barbell on his back. And this is what I am inviting you to try to think about. Like when you're exercising, what are you trying to do? Right? You're not really developing maximum strength. You're not really developing, a, a, let's say, a trans transferable skill. So the exercise on the right for me is essentially a waste of time compared to, let's say, doing something like stabilized maximum effort, depending on your goal. Okay, so the next strategy is what we call sequential recruitment, and it ties in directly with what we talked about in terms of targeted muscle fatigue. So what is sequential recruitment? <clears throat> in order to understand sequential recruitment, you have to understand that um, we have three different types of, we actually have two different types of muscle fibers, and um, we have a slow twitch, type 1, an intermediate, and then we have a fast twitch, uh, type 2 muscle fiber. So just imagine you have two types of muscle fibers. The one is uh, slow twitch. It's a little bit smaller, but it also uh, takes longer to fatigue and it recovers very quickly. And contrast that with our type 2 fibers. The, uh, these are very strong, very large um, uh, they fatigue quickly, but they also and they also take a while to recover. These are the two main types of fibers we have, and then we've got intermediate fibers. If you think of them on a continuum, essentially we don't actually really have one, two, three, or just two types. We actually have many different types that exist on a continuum, and we've actually identified seven different ones. But anyway, the point is that you have to understand that um, when you use your muscle, 
the amount of muscle fibers that are involved when you're doing uh, when you're contracting is in direct proportion to the force demands placed on that muscle. So if the force demand, if, I, if I'm lifting my phone, you can imagine the muscles that's firing my arm. Um, I don't need a lot of muscles, right? But if I'm actually if I'm going to be lifting a really heavy dumbbell, um, I need to produce way more force in proportion to the weight that I'm holding, and I'm going to start to involve more and more muscle fibers. Now, sequential recruitment is just the idea that you're going to be um, uh, what we want to do is we want to select the load that's not too heavy because then if you can imagine you pick up something that's really heavy you can imagine you probably only lift it for one or two or maybe even three repetitions depending on how heavy it is right but then the exercise sets very short likewise if you do an exercise where the um, load is very low you can do like thousands of reps right okay now what's the ideal range now there's no ideal range for all outcomes but there are ideal ranges for very particular outcomes for a very particular person so the ideal range for us is to select the load where we can recruit the type 1 muscle fibers um, and then the type 2 muscle fibers in sequence in proportion of demand. In order to do that, we select the load that allows us to recruit type 1 fibers and then fatigue them and then recruit the type 2A fibers, let's say the intermediate um, motor units, fatigue them and then we move on to the our biggest, largest, strongest fibers and we recruit them and fatigue them because remember the muscle fiber that you don't recruit is not subject to adaptation. So we want to involve as many as we possibly can. Okay, so again, what does sequential recruitment mean? It means that we recruit muscle, all our muscle fibers in sequence of, um, let's say, size and capability. So again, I'm going to repeat that. What is sequential recruitment? It's you're recruiting a muscle fiber, right, in sequence of the size and capability of the muscle fibers that you have. Okay. This is very important because the two muscle growth triggers and strength development triggers that, that um, we've identified, we are able to stimulate both of them in the sequential recruitment strategy. Okay. So... The growth trigger one is we need to be able to produce as much force as we poss possibly can um, or we need to recruit as many muscle fibers as we possibly can so they can become subject to adaptation. But then to just recruit them once um, may not be enough. So we want to recruit them, keep them recruited and then fatigue them and, uh, until the movement actually stops into what we call failure. Right now, the second trigger is what we call metabolic stress. Now, now you've familiar with when you do an exercise, you feel a bit of a pump or a burn in the muscle, and that is what we call metabolic stress. Now, what we want to do with sequential recruitment is we want to have both mechanical tension, which is um, again recruiting as many muscle fibers as we can as the anabolic signal, and then we want to keep them recruited and fatigue them. Um, until they can no longer uh, uh, fire um, as the adaptive response. So this image here basically shows you, if you can imagine that the purple circles here represent our big fast twitch muscle fibers, our intermediate fibers are the orange ones, and then the green are the slow twitch, um, let's say uh, slow to fatigue uh, and fast recovering muscle fibers. If you can imagine that in, uh, in 10x, our exercise set is 60 seconds, right? In order for your exercise set to last 60 seconds, right, you have to select the load where you reach failure around the 60 second mark or between 8 and 12 reps. For us, it's specifically 12 reps at 5 seconds, which you'll see. Now, as you start your movement, you recruit your uh, lower order type 1 muscle fibers and then you fatigue them at this point. So let's say this is the 15 second mark. Type 1 fibers, they are not, uh, they, they either, they do not not strong enough to produce force in proportion to the resistance or they fatigue. And so then you start to recruit your intermediate muscle fibers. And again, it's for the same reason, either the, they weaken um, to the degree that these fibers weaken is the degree to which they are going to call on higher order of uh, fast twitch, stronger muscle fibers, like the purple one here. And so by the time you get to your 60 second mark here, you've recruited type 1, intermediate, and type 2 muscle fibers and fatigue them until you um, stop. 
and that's basically the stimulus. Now, the quickly, what I want to just uh, uh, explain to you here is what we call the process of mechanotransduction. Now, remember, the undisputed mechanism of, of hypertrophy or muscular growth is that of mechanical tension. Okay. In order for us to uh, produce an adaptive response, the, we have to recruit our fast twitch muscle fibers um, through a mechanism called mechanotransduction. Okay. And so mechanotransduction uh, is basically, um, we have what we call mechanosensors in our muscles um, and in our skin that can detect uh, changes in stretch and forces which sends a signal. This is what actually stimulates this uh, um, anabolic signaling cascade for growth. That's the mechanical tension, the uh, mechanical tension mechanism. The next mechanism is what we call the mechanism of met metabolic stress. What is metabolic stress? Now remember, you feel the burn in the muscle when your muscle is being under tension for a certain period of time. What's happening there is because your body is producing um, ATP through glycolysis, eventually it produces um, ATP and the byproduct lactate um, and then as a result an accumulation of hydrogen ions and this makes the cell you could say a more, uh, it, it actually lowers, uh, increases the pH which means it makes it more acidic and that's what gives you that burning sensation. Um, now growth or researchers have found that um, uh, a lot of the growth is basically um, triggered by the, this signaling cascade of cellular swelling, of elevated hormonal responses that is, is, is associated with uh, metabolic stress. And also, when the cell becomes more acidic, um, produces more lactate, uh, that's also been associated with you being able to recruit more muscle fibers to, to, to come to get involved. Now remember, if the muscle fiber that... You, the muscle fiber you don't recruit is a muscle fiber that won't adapt. So only that which is adapted based on the specificity principle is subject to change. Okay, so moving on to the third strategy is what we call accentuated negatives. And it also relates to uh, all th uh, the, the two muscle growth triggers that we talked about and targeted muscle fatigue. Okay, so what is accentuated negatives? Now, all exercises have what we call a positive phase and a negative phase, right? Or a lifting phase and a lowering phase. So, an easy one to understand is, let's say, a bicep curl. So, if you can imagine, if I'm lift, the lifting phase is when I'm lifting a weight against gravity, right? That's the lifting phase or what we call the concentric phase. When we lower the weight, that's what we call the negative uh, part of the movement. And so, the negative part of the movement it's also what we call the eccentric phase. Eccentric meaning moving away from our center. Um, research has shown the, uh, a very, very close correlation or association between the negative phase um, of the movement and muscular um, growth. Now, let's quickly talk about that. First of all, you need to realize that, and this is not intuitive, but you're 25% stronger lowering weight than lifting weight, okay? What does this mean? So let's say you were doing a squat, right? You can lower down more than what you can lift up, whether that's on with a barbell or whether that's on a leg press machine. So gravity has nothing to do with this. If you think, oh, coming back up, you're going against gravity. No, that's not what I mean. So we can actually uh, calculate this pound for pound. You can produce more force, um, in the negative phase of the movement, right? So for instance, let's say I was lifting 50 kgs as a bicep curl, right? Now, if it's 50 kg, let's say that's my max, I can only lift it once. What's interesting is, if I push down on you as maximum and you could resist it, let's say you could resist me pushing you down, and if I could measure that, you could see that you could resist me where I'm not able to push you down and that will exceed 50 kgs. That would roughly be, you'd probably be able to produce 60 to 65 kgs of force um, compared to the positive phase. So remember, you're strongest in the negative part of movement. Now, what we want to do is we want to exploit that. We don't want to rush the negative movement. So many exercise programs completely overlook this. And, but here's why. Here's, here's what happens with the negatives. 
Because when we do a positive, you know, when we lift, a, uh, lift let's say lift a weight, because it feels harder, it feels harder, because it is actually harder when we lift it compared to when we lower it, because we're stronger when we lower it. Because it feels harder uh, when we lift it, we make the association that that is the most benefit part of the movement, because it, it, we experience it as harder, but that is the erroneous conclusion to derive from um, uh, what the research actually shows. Now, why is, now, a couple of things about the negative training. Why is it so important? Well, first of all, because you're stronger, we want to spend more time there in that movement. We don't want to just like, if you imagine you do a push-up, you don't want to just drop the ground. You want to lower it slowly so that, again, we can uh, um, fatigue the muscle fibers during that negative or lowering phase of the movement. But research, research has also shown that um, a, a, a exercise-induced muscle damage has been prim primarily associated with the negative part of the movement. But that's, you can kind of imagine that, right? So remember, when, you're, when a muscle is, um, let's say, shortening, that is when you're lifting a weight. But if I am lowering a weight, my muscle is stretching. So, the lo so when a muscle is stretching, think of this as like a resistance band, right? So if you had a resistance band, um, you would pull it together, no problem. But if you start to pull it apart, we think that when we um, stretch a muscle under load, that uh, that's what's responsible for the actual microscopic muscle tears in muscle um, or in our in the muscle fibers. Now, insofar as so, yeah. So insofar, insofar as the, the uh, uh, growth occurs as a result of muscle damage or is associated with muscle, muscle, muscle damage, you can obviously, uh, we can obviously see why, um, you know, doing negative training um, can have a benefit impact. So if we do, if, if microtrauma or muscle damage is associated with growth because it stimulates protein synthesis and obviously repair processes like cell, satellite cell proliferation, where the muscles are almost actually being replaced. I'm going to about to show you an image of what that looks like in a moment. But the other, make, the other proposed mechanism of why um, when, you, when we overload the negative phase or spend more time in the negative phase of the movement, the reason why we, we also see uh, that's associated with muscle growth is because we can actually get a deeper inroad. Now remember, inroad means the... the, 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 the controlled and strategic weakening of a muscle in a short period of time. And again, the threshold was at least 25%. Did you know that if you did a single set of exercise um, and, and, and created a deep enough inroad, that would be sufficient to stimulate an adaptive response? One set in one exercise, right? Okay, anyway, so because inroad uh, is associated with muscle growth and because, mus because we see increased muscle fiber recruitment um, associated with negative training, that's also probably why we see an improved adaptation. Because remember, if we recruit more muscle fibers in the negative phase, um, then that's probably uh, uh, then more associated to the first muscle trigger called mechanical tension, and that's probably why we see growth there. But also, we see increased metabolic stress per exercise set when we do accentuated negative. So, um, so many reasons why we have to accentuate the negative, meaning when we doing when we lower the movement, we do it slowly and we do it mindfully. Okay, so this is just an image to show you what I mean if you didn't you know get it from my uh, um, silly demonstrations. So this would be the uh, lifting phase, that would be the lowering phase of the movement, and that would be the negative. This would be the positive. And this is a myograph taken of a muscle before and after eccentric loading or uh, uh, loading the muscle um, in, a, in a stretched position. Uh, the triangles here essentially indicate uh, the Z disc of a sarcomere, which is just essentially how muscle sarcomeres line up. You can see how they've been completely distorted, damaged here. And this circle here, as you can you just click pause and read this as well. It shows like entire obliteration of a sarcomere. Um, and again, insofar as this degree of muscle damage is associated with um, the inflammatory response and uh, satellite cell proliferation is associated with growth is the extent to which 
you know, negative training can help us um, stimulate. So next we have circuit training. So this is the fourth strategy. So everyone's familiar with circuit training, right? But there are a lot of problems with the way traditional circuit training is performed. But before we get there, let's quickly define what circuit training is for those who don't know. Circuit training is essentially where you have a certain number of exercises and um, that is usually full body. So you've got different resistance exercises targeting different muscle groups and you kind of do a single cycle would represent where you move through all the different exercises once and then you could maybe do you know a couple of cycles. Now, the before I go to the problems, let me explain to you the benefits. The benefits are really cool. Now, the, I love the idea of circuit training because what it does is it allows you to get a full body routine um, in a very short period of time because you're not resting between exercises. And you also, you research shows that you can stimulate a cardiovascular um, endurance adaptive response while focusing on your strength training and muscle growth goals, which I really, really like because, again, cardiovascular fitness is like the foundation of your metabolic health and fitness and therefore a foundation to your strength training, right? However, the problem with traditional circuit training is that uh, it's usually done, that the exercises they select are really poor, the order is, is not great, and the load that they use is not sufficient enough to really stimulate, uh, um, let's say, maximum strength or um, osteogenesis, which is bone growth, right? Now, I love the circuit training model, but it had to be modified, it had to be improved. And the way that we improved it was, we wanted to we select the fewest number of exercises, right? Three. We, we select, we, uh, we do them in the, or, in the best order possible, starting with the most, the most difficult exercise first, because you're most fresh, but also when you stimulate, when you do the most, the most difficult exercise first, you, um, the hemodynamic response is highest as well, meaning your heart rate, blood pressure rise very quickly, and then what we want to do is get it as high as possible, keep it as high as possible throughout the entire workout. Why? Because research has shown that if you can get your heart rate uh, to about 120 to 130 beats per minute minimum and keep it there for 15 minutes, you absolutely will stimulate an adaptive response in terms of your vascular endurance, which is stunning, right? Which is what we're trying to do. Now, we do three exercises. We do a lower body exercise because it, 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 lower body exercise uh, involves the most musculature and if it, the more musculature you involve the, the greater the hemodynamic response blood pressure and heart rate and so forth um, we start with that and then we move on to an upper body exercise and another upper body exercise and then we repeat that right so a single circuit for 10x is three exercises right done twice so you've got six exercises in total now if you want to actually see this in action just go to YouTube put in my name and you'll actually see a home workout and a gym workout where I actually do this. For what, where I move from one exercise to the next, targeted muscle, targeted muscle failure is the, is the mode, um, sequential recruitment, you can actually see the load that I choose allows me to, right, uh, um, to do a certain amount of reps where I can kind of uh, sequentially recruit the different muscle fibers and then fatigue them until I reach uh, a real failure point. Um, and then um, do it in a way where I've got accentuated negatives, where my negatives are very controlled, much slower than the positives, where I push. And then again, you can then see it done in a circuit uh, fashion, where I move from exercise to exercise. So again, the benefit of circuit training is immense that, again, it allows us to get a full body workout. Now, oh, one thing I really wanted to mention here, right, was though there's no rest between exercises, there's roughly three minutes rest between different muscle groups. So for example, if I do a lower body exercise, upper body, upper body, by the time I get back to my, sec my, my second circuit or cycle, I'm going again, I'm doing lower body, upper body, upper body, and then I'm doing lower body again. By the time I get to my lower body again, the same muscle group, um, I've already had three minutes of rest. And again, we want at least three minutes of rest if we're going to do another cycle, because this allows us to... Um, let's say replenish all the uh, high energy phosphates that allow us to have um, high intensity, high quality muscular contraction for roughly 10 to 15 uh, seconds. So that this will allow us to get a very powerful and high quality set in the second round. Okay, so this image basically shows you the old traditional models like squats, push-ups, jumping jacks, you're doing lunges, and this is not bad. It's still really good. Like I said, I love the circuit training model, but 
Um, it, it just had to be improved. And so this is what ours looks like. A squat, a pull, and a push. This is the bodyweight version. You can actually see it on machines. So you do a squat, pull up, and a push up. Okay, now we move on to the uh, fifth and final strategy that we call triple progression. So what does triple progression mean? Now, to really appreciate what I mean by triple progression, you should have a clear understanding by now of what I mean by progressive overload as one of the exercise principles that I discuss in my exercise principles video. But triple progression means that we have at least one of three ways that we can continuously adjust the intensity in proportion to your rate of improvement so you can make continuous progress. And we do that in terms of the exercise load or weight, the exercise itself, its difficulty, or uh, time variables, which we'll get to in a moment. But first, um, realize that in 10x, we have four ways to detect progress, right? All valid ways of uh, measuring progress. And then we have three ways of adjusting the intensity in proportion to your rate of progress. But let's quickly talk about progress for a moment, because the reason we have what we call triple progression, because to just use one variable for me is kind of misleading, right? Let me give an example. So because with particularly 10X and other strength training programs, you really adapt in at least four different ways. First is stress tolerance. You're becoming more psychologically fit, higher fortitude. Neuromuscular efficiency, you get better and better at doing the movement. So did you get stronger or did you get better at doing the movement? Or were you a lot uh, stronger mentally that day? Or is it strength, right? How are we defining strength exactly? And then what about endurance, right? So maybe, um, maybe there was an adaptation in your metabolic capacity to produce more energy and so the rate of fatigue was less. So is it really improvement in strength? or did you become more fatigue resistant? Now, the reason I pose this question is because it's, it's nearly impossible, it's virtually impossible to really separate these variables. So instead of trying to separate them, just know that you're making to different degrees an adaptation in all four of these at the same time. And it, for me, doesn't make sense to try and isolate them. So let me give you an example, right? So imagine you're at the gym and you see a guy and he's doing 10 exercises. And his previous workout, let's say, was 40 minutes in the gym. Now, he's, um, he just clocked for his second workout 48 minutes. But in his eighth, eighth exercise, let's say it was a strict shoulder press, he made improvement in his strength, or that's what he thinks. So let's say he did, in his first workout, as his eighth exercise in that workout, he uh, did 10 repetitions on a certain load. His second workout now, okay, now the total workout time, if you actually measured it, is 48 minutes. And his eighth exercise, still the shoulder press, right? Now he did 14 reps. Now he's thinking, wow, I got so much stronger in my shoulders because my last workout, I did, you know, 10 reps. And today's workout, I did four reps, okay? Now, did he get stronger or did he have more rest to replenish let's say, high energy phosphates in his anaerobic energy system to produce those extra reps. Why? Because remember, workout one was 40 minutes, workout two was 48 minutes. Like, eight minute difference, right? Where did that eight minutes go? Well, he didn't know that, but he spent four minutes resting between his seventh exercise and his eighth exercise, and that allowed him to push 14 reps instead of 10 reps. Do you see what I'm saying? So for me, you can't just say that's an improvement in strength. For, if, for, for me, it's more just, um, uh, you know, you gave him extra time to recover so that he could produce more reps. So we can't, re we can't separate these variables. Um, so instead, we, tra we track all of them and, 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 and identify them as all equally valid uh, measures of progress. And so that when we, uh, um, let's say, track a workout, we're looking at your load. We're looking at the amount of reps that you did. Your, the exercise that the specific exercise that you did, the machine you used, the, the position of the machine, what was the workout time, what was the rest period between exercises, what was the, uh, the uh, rest period between reps, what was the total time under tension. When I track a workout, I track all of these variables so that I can detect progress in improved reps on the same load 
or improved load for the same reps or increased difficulty on the same exercise for the same reps which is almost is identical to increased load which I'll show you in a bit um, and decrease total workout time which shows you an improvement in usually in metabolic fitness and as well as an improvement in time under tension or um, shorter interset rest periods. <sighs> well, that was a lot. Okay, let me show you some pictures so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's an example of triple progression where as you get stronger, as you get fitter, as you become more capable, you, can imp you obviously go up in weight, you can make the exercise more difficult, or you can rest for shorter periods, right? Sometimes you can't rest for shorter periods because you can't do another rep, right? Have you ever, you're, let's say you're trying to do 12 reps and you hit, you hit failure at 10, and now to get those last two, you literally have to rest in order to get there, but the next time maybe you do 12 you know, in one row, uh, in a row, and so your total workout time starts to come down because you recovered a lot faster, Again, is that strength, is that stress tolerance, is that neuromuscular efficiency, are you getting better doing the movement? You cannot separate these things. Okay, so let me show you. So three ways that we adjust the intensity so that you can always improve. Number one, load progression, just increase the weight. What I like about machines is that you can just, these are plate loaded weight stack machines that you can just quickly adjust the intensity in proportion to how strong you get. Dumbbells is how you would do that again. This, if you were at home, you'd probably have you know multiple sets of dumbbells so that you can continuously improve. Uh, you can do use a weight vest and in, uh, you know increase the load incrementally. Now we move on to exercise progression. So this is how we would improve the or this is how we would adjust the intensity with exercise progression. Now imagine you do a push up. Let's say as you get twelve reps. Now remember with ten x you're doing. You're selecting a load where you can hit failure within exactly 12 reps, 5 seconds per rep, giving us exactly 60 seconds per exercise. Now, let's say you can go do 15 push-ups. Okay, well, now it's time to make the exercise more difficult. You can slap on a weight vest or, huh, try this. Try to do your push-ups on uh, gymnastics rings. What you're doing there is you're making it a lot more difficult because you're involving, you've got less stability, which means you've got to involve a lot more muscles uh, to stabilize that position um, and again I only recommend this if you are if you're strong enough that where you have you have perfect form with 12 reps at the exact cadence of three seconds on the lowering phase one second or fast in the on the positive phase and maybe a pause in the hardest position of the exercise okay the another way you can uh, that we progress uh, an exercise is by decreased leverage. So you could do push-ups and all you could do is basically shift your weight forward. You're basically decreasing the leverage you have and uh, thereby you're, uh, you're, you're shifting the center of mass to be a lot to be against you, to be a lot more difficult. Like in this example, we have a pseudo planche push-up and then this is a lot harder, right? Um, so again, you can in see how many ways we can in make an exercise more difficult. Another thing is just change the exercise entirely. So instead of doing a push-up, you're doing a dip. But so as, lo as long as you're, you're targeting the same muscle group, then you can exchange the uh, push-up with the uh, dip. It says ring dip, but it's actually there, a uh, parallel bar dip, but who cares. So the, now the next is time progression, right? So you'll notice that if you... And no one does this. No one actually times their total workout time. It's essential. You have to time, like, based on the example that I gave you, right? This person now thinks, oh, you got so much stronger in your shoulder press. In the meantime, you had eight minutes extra rest before your shoulder press. Of course, he's going to do more reps. He's had more time to rest. So he didn't make progress in strength. In fact, we don't know if he made any progress because we don't have his total workout time. So it's important to track your total workout time. Um, ooh, okay. And... So yeah, so what you're trying to do here is try to rest uh, for shorter periods between exercise. You'll notice we actually spend quite a lot of time moving from exercise to exercise, so we want to reduce that time. And another one is just increasing your time under tension is a way to see that. But for our purposes in 10x, ours is always trying to is it always going to be 60 seconds because it's five seconds per rep, 12 reps at your 12 RM, um, giving us 60 seconds, and so. But another variable to keep in mind when you are tracking and one, one that we can adjust as we go along. 
And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to me, taking you through the uh, five strategies that make 10x work the way that it works.